Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, all right, so without further ado, we're going to go to the second project, which is about city bikes, called Self-Balancing Bikes. I'm just going to turn it over uh, to Donald Hansen, who's going to kick it off. There you go. Good evening. <laughs> so, again, my name is Donald Hansen, and the name of our project is Self-Balancing Bikes in Bike Schemes. So, over the past couple of years, bike sharing programs have surged in popularity all over the globe, with a lot of um, bike sharing schemes popping up in Europe and a lot in um, the United States. And if you see this blue dot here, this is this bike sharing scheme that we're going to be talking about today, which is City Bike. Now, a couple things about City Bike before we start. City Bike opened May 2013, and even though it's about a year old, it's quickly become the largest bike sharing scheme in the United States, has over 90,000 annual users, 6,000 bikes, and over 20 to 40,000 trips per day. So this is being heavily used by people. So back to uh, bike schemes. So most bike schemes are located in cities. And these cities have a usual pattern on how they're laid out. They have, um, <laughs> they have populated business areas throughout the city and then populated residential areas. So on a normal day, pe right, people who live in the city are going to be going, traveling to the business areas in the morning. And at night, they're going to go from those business areas back into the residential areas. And we're seeing that with that happens with bike schemes as well. So these riders are taking bikes from these residential areas and moving all of them to the business areas. And at the end of the day, they take the bikes and they move them all back to the residential areas. Now, this is good, but this creates a load imbalance problem. And basically, you're going to see a lot of stations that are empty at certain times. And at the same time, um, maybe a couple blocks away, there's going to be stations that are completely full. So this is a problem that all bike, sh bike schemes face. Now, what City Bike's doing to try to fix this problem is they're taking vans and they're transporting bikes to empty stations. So basically, here's an example. Let's say in Midtown, we have a station that has about, you know, that's completely full. And a couple blocks away, we have a station that's empty. What the vans do is they take bikes from these full stations and move them over to the empty stations to try to help ease the demand on both stations. And this varies um, on how popular the station is. So for every 10 to 20 rider trips, there's one van transport, in which, um, and the, transport, the transports amount to 10 to 15% of their gross revenue, which is a lot of a heavy cost on the city bike program. And basically, this is very costly for city bike, and they're trying to look into new ways to um, help solve this problem without you know, pouring out more money. So one of the things we try to look at is, can we use riders because there's so many riders. Can we use riders to help naturally balance the system? And would small changes in the riders' routes, uh, routes help? So again, this would be um, basically looking at how well you know, these vans are doing right now and then seeing, could this help us potentially? So before we went into the analysis, we need to have some data. So we got our data from two main places. The first was from City Bikes' website, and they give us system data. So you can see here, they give us trips. So for each trip, we have the bike ID, so which bike it was, the start time, start station, start station, and station, and some more information. And they have this data from July 2013 to um, May 2014. And this basically gives us rider movement. So we're, we're knowing where the bikes are going and where they're coming. And also, we got data from Abe Stanway, who's a uh, data engineer. And he collected data from City Bike over the process of over the process of a year, a couple months. And basically, at each moment, he took a snapshot of how many bikes were at a station and how many um, docks were available to park the bike at those stations. And that basically gives us an idea of how well each station is doing, so how many bikes are at each station. So all this data gives us a complete view of the network and how well City Bike is doing in general. So using that, we, we made some basic plots to see how the City, um, city Bike is working. So over here, we have user usage patterns over the day. On the x-axis, we have time, so over like a 24-hour uh, interval. And on the y-axis, we have the number of trips. So the red line represents the weekdays, and the green line represents the weekends. As you can see, 
the number of trips during the weekday peaks at certain times between the rush hour times, 6, uh, 6 a.m., 10 a.m., when people are going to work. And it peaks again at the end of the day at between 4 p.m. and 8 a.m. when people are leaving work. And this makes sense. So, but if you, if you look at the weekends, the weekends are l less is going on because they're more of joy rides and things like that. So for our analysis, we're going to be analyzing the weekdays because that's the, those are the times that we actually care about, like the demand in the system. And the last thing we, we looked at, um, <laughs> the ne next thing we analyzed was the trip length, We're just looking at how long um, each trip is. So it's between typical 15 and 30 city blocks. We're seeing like how far they're going on average. So it's something we usually look at. And to talk about the system health and how well um, stations are doing is my colleague Jahaziel. All right. Hello, my name is Jahaziel Guzman and I'll be talking to you about the status of the current system where we can see problems and possibly diagnose some solutions. So in our data we had a value called availability for each station at certain times and what this told us is the number of bikes that were parked at a certain station and what we did was we averaged this availability per station for every hour in a, in a day over all days for each hour and what we can see here in this first panel is uh, during at 6 a.m. before the morning rush hour we have the average distribution of bikes at 6 a.m. over all days and we can see that there is a pretty high concentration around here in Greenwich Village as well as, I mean, sorry, East Village as well as Greenwich Village and also um, residential areas around Barclays Center. And this tells us that, okay, people are about to go to work. Some of them might still be sleeping. The bikes are at parked around residential areas so users can use them to go to work. And here at 3 p.m. we have the average availability and we see that there's a higher concentration around here, 5th, 6th, 7th Avenues, business areas, downtown, around Barclay Center. And what that tells us is that, okay, users are getting to their workplaces and they're parking there and they're leaving their bikes there. And then we see here at 8 p.m. after the evening rush hour, we see again a concentration back to residential areas here. And this is pretty predictable throughout the day. This is averaged uh, over periods of the day. And we can see that most of the users are commuters. In fact, they are. Most of the users are commuters. And they have pretty predictable usage, usage patterns. Now, we have this animation here showing us the changes over the course of a day, averaging per hour over all days in the data, the availability. So again, we see this pattern where in the afternoon, we have a concentration here in the business areas, and at night, we see a concentration back in residential and in the morning until the rush hour. Now, we wanted to kind of have an idea of the percentage full that a station was, or its fullness. So what we did was, is for each station, at each time interval that we had, we obtain that percentage by dividing the available bikes at a station by its total capacity. And using this percentage, we could diagnose a station as either, or label a, a station as either congested or starved. And a station was congested if its percentage full was more than 80%. So if it was, if it was more than 80% full, and it was starved if it was less than 20% full. So using this, these are valuable metrics to then assess two possible problems in uh, our in the system where if a station is congested there are too many bikes at that station and it may be possibly hard for m multiple users to park their bikes at those stations and if a station is starved there are too few bikes and users may not be able to start trips at those stations and again we have over the course of a day average for each hour over all the days in our data the average number of starved stations and the average number of congested stations in our data. As we see, starvation is much more common. It's around 40%, almost 50%, and the congestion peaks at about 13% or 12%. So an interesting number here, there are 
57 bikes for every 100 docks if the system was balanced. So clearly we see that that's not the case. We see that, uh, if, that if this was true, in our case, it would, all stations would be 57% full and the system would tend more toward congestion because uh, 57 is closer to 80 than to 20%. But we see that that's not the case, that uh, starvation is very huge in our system and this can be attributed to rider flow. Obviously our system is not balanced. So to talk about vehicle transports, my colleague Frankie Rodriguez. Okay, thank you. So as was mentioned before, City Bike is, has this scheme where they have workers and vans drive around and they pick up bikes and they place them where the demand is needed. Now, City Bike publishes a monthly report where they have totals of how many bikes they, tr they rebalanced every single month, but they do not provide information on where they picked the bikes up, how many they picked up, and where and what time they picked them up. So in order to f try to find these, these numbers, we had to dig into the data and find them ourselves. So we took all of the data and we ordered it by looking at each individual bicycle throughout all time and finding any inconsistencies in the data. And an example would be something like this. In this case, we're looking at bike I, bike A, bike ID A. And we're following it throughout the day. And we see it starts at West 41st Broadway. It ends at West 51st and 6th Avenue. Then it starts at West 51st and 6th Avenue. It ends at West 21st and 6th. And then suddenly, it starts at West 41st and Broadway, <laughs> and there's no indication of how it got there at all in the data. And then it continues as normal, going through the original cycle. Every time we see something like this, we know that somebody had to move it manually because there's no record of anybody swiping their card and getting the bicycle off the rack. So using this data, we take it for every single bicycle, for every single trip throughout time, and we can total those numbers to give us an estimate of how many bikes they're transporting. But now we actually have the time and where and when they're being taken and what numbers. So before we go to the next slide, we do notice that this is imperfect as this will also include any attempts that um, somebody tried to lock their bicycle and it did not lock correctly. So it never, somebody could have pulled it out. It also includes bicycles that were taken for reparation and theft in general. So using this data, we can now make a plot where we have the maps of where the bicycles are being picked up and where they are being dropped off. So as you can see, bicycles are being picked up everywhere throughout the city. The bigger the circle and the more red means more bicycles are taken by workers. And the bigger, same thing for drop-offs. So bicycles are being taken everywhere throughout the island of Manhattan. Especially, you can see that bicycles are being taken a lot in Union Square. People like to take their bicycle to Union and um, just drop it off there, I guess, to hang around. And then workers have to go and pick them up. And then they also drop them off at the major transit hubs, right here where um, Port Authority is, Grand Central Station, Times Square. Um, bicycles are also being picked up a lot at Penn Station. And if you notice, they're dropped off much less around the outskirts, whereas they are picked up a lot more around the outskirts of Manhattan. Now, notice that there are two big circles in the center, and that means that workers are dropping off bicycles there and picking them up there. That makes no sense, but if you <laughs> consider that these are at different times throughout the day, then that explains why this is happening. Now, this gives you an overall picture for the entire transportation um, scheme, but we wanted to go a little bit deeper because these are for the entire island. We wanted to find for each individual station what happens. So looking at that, we were able to find patterns throughout each individual station. Here we have four of the most, well, the four types of stations that we, we were able to find. Uh, Broadway and 41st is an example of a station that has a lot of drop-offs in the evening after the rush. 51st and, 8th Ave and 6th Avenue is an example where there's a lot of pickups in the morning. 41st and 8th Avenue, Times Square, is where you see the two giant dots on the, on the map before, mm -hmm. where they have a lot of pickups in the evening and a lot of drop-offs in the afternoon. And then all the other, most of the other stations I mean, the majority of stations look something like this, where they have a fee every now and then, nothing too big. Now, look at, if you look at these two on the left, please notice that West 41st and Broadway and West 41st and 8th Avenue are about two blocks away from each other. Yet, at the same time, bicycles are being picked up a lot and dropped off a lot at the same time within each other. 
Um, we're going to continue with West 41st in a bit. No, West 51st, where bikes are being dropped off at this time. So here we have West 41st and Broadway. And we try to calculate, we, we try to calculate the impact that this is having in the system. We want to fix the system, so we want to see how much can we fix it compared to the vans. So what we did is we had some sort of simulated world where we say, let's pretend none of that happened. The workers didn't exist, fans didn't exist. We just have the people and nothing else. So looking at the actual data, we have West 41st and Broadway, and they have 10 bikes available. And then people keep departing from there. And suddenly there's 22 trips. Now we saw in the previous slides that workers drop off a lot of bikes around 4, 10 p.m. from 4 to 6. But what if they weren't there? Well, we would have 10, then 9, and it slowly decreases until it reaches zero, and nobody's going to go and manually pick up these bikes. So using that, we can count how many times a trip would have happened if it, no, how many times somebody would have wanted to start a trip at an empty station, and how many times somebody would have wanted to end the trip at a full station. And we can tag these stations like this. Whenever we reach zero for a capacity, we can tag them, and we can count how many times this happens throughout the system, and compare that rate for the overall amount of trips. What this looks like is that when you take that estimate, we have that 5.6% of all the trips that we won that would have, um, well, all those failures account for 5.6% of trips. So that means that if you wanted to take a trip and there were no vans, 5% of your trips would have failed. Also, it also puts into account how much effect the vans are having on the system. The vans rebalance about 10% of all the bicycles in total, and half of those each serve one station that one trip that would have not happened otherwise. What we are not taking into account is that people would obviously know that the station is full, so they would not try to start a trip there. They would go somewhere else. Also, City Bike does not provide how many trips failed anyways, because right now, if you wanted to go outside and take a trip, like at the Chelsea station across the street, it would most likely be empty or full, depending on what you want to do. And you will not be able to take a trip. Or if you want to drop off a bike there and it's full, you can actually swipe in your card, and City Bike will give you 15 extra minutes to go find another station. And if City Bike provided that data for us, we would be able to estimate how much this is having an effect versus their system. So this is great, but we can't just ignore the fact that we can, we can just take out vans and that's it. It solves the problem. Um, what if we had a system where we had no vans, and as was mentioned before, stations are everywhere throughout the city. They're very close in proximity. What if we had a system where there's no vans and we can still have a lower rate of congestion? And in order to do that, we're going to have my colleague here, Brianna Vecchioni. She's going to talk about our rerouting scheme. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Frankie, for that very thorough introduction. Um, yeah, so as Frankie said before, uh, we did our first simulation assuming that there were no vans in the system, and now we're going to do a simulation um, that attempts to rebalance the system using rider rerouting. Okay, so what was our potential for local rebalancing? Well, according to our statistics, the median distance to the nearest station is 218 meters, and by that same token, the median distance to the third nearest station is 311 meters. So what does that mean? That basically means that 91% of all of the stations have another station within 300 meters. Now that's about the same length as one New York City Avenue, so clearly these stations are not very far apart. So if we can find the availability and the differences between the availability at ev any given time, we might be able to have some serious potential for local rebalancing. Right? So that's exactly what we did. Um, right here on our x-axis is every station's availability. And on our y-axis, we called our average neighbor's availability. Now, what this means, essentially, is that for any given station, we took the three nearest stations and averaged their availability into one exact value, and then plotted it on the chart right here. Um, this chart uh, depicts the system at 6 p.m. Why do we choose 6 p.m.? Well, we chose it because uh, it's a commuter time. People are getting off work. They're going home. And it's going to be able to depict the system uh, very clearly, especially with the imbalances. Right? So what does this chart tell us? Well, if the dots were along the 45-degree line, that would indicate that 
there wasn't a whole lot of potential for local rebalancing because the x-axis for any given station, the closest stations, have about the same availability and there's not a whole lot that we can do, but we don't see that here. What we're seeing is persistent differences that exist between the, any given station and its neighbors. I'm going to pick out a few outliers here. Down here we have FDR Drive in East 35th, which is clearly uh, relatively full around 6 p.m., while its neighbors have a much, much lower availability rate and the converse situation for House in Hudson right here. So this is what we did with our simulation model. Right here is a screenshot of the City Bike app, and each little blue raindrop figure indicates a station, and then the, the dark blue line indicates the level of availability of that station. So the higher the blue line is, the more bikes are there, and the lower the blue line is, the less bikes are there. So our simulation did two things. The first thing it did was it redirected departures at starved stations to the nearby station with the most available bikes. So I'm going to give an example right here. Uh, oop. Somebody wants to go from Times Square around here down to this station right here. But we see that this Times Square station is pretty empty, right? There's not a whole lot of bikes there, and it would actually imbalance the system if somebody were to take a bike out. So what we do instead is we see that its neighboring station right here is relatively full by comparison. So we move the commuter over about an avenue, again, and uh, take them to their destination. Conversely, we do the same with arrivals. So we redirect the arrivals at congested stations to the nearby station with the most available docks. So again, we t uh, the commuter's taking their, station, er, their trip from right here, and they're trying to go here. But we see that this station down here, it's blue, so it's almost full. They're trying to take the last dock in that station. And we don't want that, because again, that's going to provide more imbalance to the system. But we see about an avenue away again, this station is relatively empty. So we're just going to reroute them uh, about, a, uh, about an avenue away. So uh, what was the data from that? Well, we're going to compare our two simulations. So on the right here, you see the no van simulation and its levels of starvation and congestion. And then on the left here, you see our no vans plus rerouting simulation that we just implemented. And you can see for both, um, the lines decrease, but you see that local rerouting drastically reduces congestion on average, but global patterns still drive most of starvation because that's simply just the rider flow. That's how the system works. All right. So let's compare trip failures now. Well, we see that vans currently account for 10 to 15% of revenue. And as Frankie said before, uh, we don't have the data saying you know, how many people wanted to take a trip and could not do that. So we can't, uh, we can't uh, uh, measure that. But if we eliminate vans, we did see that there are 5.6% of trips that are failed trips, right? But with our algorithm that we've implemented, we've reduced the percentage to 0.8%. And we're assuming that our algorithm is a free algorithm because we're assuming that these people are ready and able and willing, rather, to go about an avenue out of their way in order to do this and rebalance the system. Right? So what are our key takeaways? Well, what does this mean and how can we change bike sharing schemes, not just for New York City, but potentially for other countries as well? Well, we see that the city bike system specifically suffers from both global and local imbalances. Right? Local we can deal with, global imbalances are global imbalances. We see that local rerouting with our simple greedy algorithm appears to be a promising way to improve our bike availability. We saw that before. And we're seeing that incentives for following reroutes and possible app development could encourage these kind of adoptions. So we said before that people might not be willing to obviously go an avenue out of their way. So we would have to introduce some kind of incentive scheme. So possibly giving people a point system within City Bike, saying, hey, if you take this trip from point A to point B during any given time, we'll give you points or we'll give you this free trip or uh, will give you some kind of incentive in order to promote that kind of behavior. All right. Well, thank you for listening to our presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them at this time. Thank you so much.